morning again. And on all serious notes, we want to go ahead and start off by saying we want to pray for the Luce family and Joe Evans family. Uh, they have become positive with COVID, so we need to uh, make sure we say a prayer for them and what they're going through and everybody else that might have it as well. Um, the second thing is all the church activities for the month of November have been um, canceled and are only online. So there's no building to go to. That is, <clears throat> excuse me, including our Wednesday night Bible class will be online. Uh, Sunday morning Bible class will be online and Sunday evening worship services will be all online for November. Um, be looking out for more updated information from the staff and the elders uh, via uh, Facebook or an email. Uh, so be looking out for that. That's where we can get all of our updates. Um, and just lastly, we just love and appreciate you all for joining us online and thanking you guys. Hopefully this will be over. I don't like it personally. Don't tell anybody I said that. Um, so I'm excited that we at least have this opportunity to get together um, before Thanksgiving and hopefully uh, in December around Christmas, we'll be back at it. Remembering that this is all um, because of Jesus and God and that's why we're worshiping. So let me go ahead and say a quick prayer and we'll get our online services started. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day. Uh, thank you for all the blessings you've given us. Right now is a, is a weird time in our lives. We seem to be focusing on that part and not the part of all the blessings that you give us that we already currently have. Please let us focus on those things. Um, please be with the Luce and the Evans family as they are going through uh, this right now. Um, please help them to uh, stay well. Please help others in their household to not get it as well. Um, and just be with us as a church that we can take care of them and take care of each other. Uh, please be with our elders as they are making decisions right now that are not only for our earthly help, uh, earthly health, but also for our heavenly health. And uh, just make sure that they are guided with you and your spirit. And uh, just help us to have a great worship service and focus on you um, during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree, his body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, Oh, praise the 
are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. You, O Lord, are my shepherd, I will never walk. You will let me rest, you will let me rest. You lead me to streams of peacefulness, you restore my you restore my soul. You will guide me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. I may walk through a valley as dark as death, but I will Hey, everybody. One of the things that um, is very interesting about um, when I do these communion talks is I, I think sometimes we think that the people that are giving the devotional or something like that need to say something profound, you know, or something that may amaze us. Um, I, I like the simple ones, uh, and that's probably a little bit weird coming from me. Um, because mine are usually a little more complicated. Um, but I'm thankful for the fact that Taylor's asked me to do this. And I say that word thankful, and I want to talk about that because that's exactly what the Eucharist is. Um, 
communion or the Eucharist is what the Greek is, is that word thankful or thanksgiving. And so on Sunday, before Thursday, um, we celebrate the true meaning of Thanksgiving. And what it should be is, is it should be, um, it should really allow Thursday, the actual Thanksgiving meal that we sit down together with our families and we enjoy that time. It actually, to me, it should help us and me understand that Thanksgiving has a real purpose. We're thankful for, for all the blessings of life. But the number one thing we are so thankful for is the fact that God included us in his plan. God gave us the opportunity to live life with him and uh, to be grateful and to have an attitude of gratitude um, during this time period. There's a book that um, I've been reading. Um, uh, Connor's read it and Ager's, Ager's read it. And I started reading it. I hadn't finished it yet, but I'm going to finish it here pretty soon. But uh, the book is called On Fire. And it's by a guy by the name of John O'Leary. And it's a great, great story. Um, he, when he was nine years old, uh, he saw some boys burning, uh, burning some gas. And it so allured him. It's so like he wanted to do it. And, and so the next day he got a hold of a five gallon gas can and uh, the fumes lit on fire and it blew up and it lit him on fire, literally lit him on fire to where a hundred percent of his body uh, was inflamed. And he runs into the house, the garage is burning down, and he's completely on fire, his clothes melting to his skin. Um, and the story goes that he survives. He survives, and he spends all this time in this book just telling his story and talking about how uh, his story uh, could be used as an inspiration. And one of the things that I've found interesting in this whole book is the fact that this guy still finds a way to celebrate life. He still finds a way to seek out the positive, to be thankful for what he's done. He goes around the world speaking to all kinds of business leaders. Um, he has a podcast. Um, I'm telling you what, this guy, 100% of his body burned. Uh, he's lost his fingers. I mean, his story is absolutely incredible. And when I think about that, and when I put life into perspective about what maybe I'm going through, or maybe what we're going through, or something like that, I really tend to go back to thankfulness. I go back to Thanksgiving. It's not just about our local family. No, it's about being thankful for our church family. It's about being thankful for the relationship that we have bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. And that is the true meaning of the Eucharist. Have a great Sunday. Enjoy the week. Let's be more thankful for everything that we have this week. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you so much. We are so fortunate. We are so blessed. And we want to offer you just the thanks that you deserve for including us in your story, for including us in wanting, desiring a relationship with us more than anything else that you would send your one and only son for us. We can't say thanks enough. It would, we would, we would have to say it for all eternity and it would never be enough. So right now during this special time, we want to say thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for ours. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, National Park Church. Christ above me, Christ beside me, Christ within me, ever guiding, Christ behind me, Christ before, Christ my love, my life, my Lord, Christ above me, Christ beside me, Christ within me, ever guiding, Christ behind me, Christ before, Christ my love, my life, my Lord, bread of life from heaven, lover of my soul, peace of God so ever present, I surrender my control to Christ above me, Christ beside me, Christ within me, ever guiding, Christ behind me, Christ before, Christ my love, my life, my Lord, mercy everlasting, tenderness divine, word of God so ever healing, I surrender heart and mind to Christ above me, Christ beside me, Christ within me, ever guiding, Christ behind me, Christ before, Christ my love, my life, my Lord, Christ my love, my life, my Lord. Well, good morning, National Park Church. We're here again for a, a virtual service. I know that there has to be difficulty and frustration with um, just this constant flux and uh, sometimes we're together and sometimes we're unable to be together. Uh, but as we've been saying as a leadership team often, we really appreciate your flexibility. We appreciate your willingness to, to go with the flow, to try to uh, navigate with us as we are going through such a strange and difficult time. Uh, of course, what I want to do is I want to say with the rest of uh, our church family that we are deeply in prayer for Patrick and for the Luce family. We want this to be a really speedy recovery. We want Patrick to come back to full health as quick as possible. And we want uh, his family not to contract this virus. And so I know that our church family is surrounding the Luces in prayer. Uh, this is such a, a real thing. And we, um, we want Patrick to, to come back to full strength as quick as possible. And it, and it becomes even more real when people that we love are, are having to engage with and deal with the virus. And, and I mentioned this in our Wednesday night class, um, if you watched it online, but I want to say it uh, again. One thing that I think Christians can do during this time is to be on our knees in prayer. And I know that may seem like we're not doing anything, and I'm the first one to admit that I've, I'm guilty of not doing that regularly enough. But there is so much heartache, there's so much suffering, there's so much pain that's going on in our world right now. Of course, we have people who are dealing, actively dealing with the virus, and the case count keeps going up, especially in our country. 
And that's a really scary thing, not just for those that have the virus, but for the family members who are caring for those who have the virus or the health workers that are caring for those that are engaging with this particular um, illness. But also there's grief and suffering because there are people all around our country and all around our world who have lost people because of this pandemic. And then there are people that are immensely anxious about their jobs and how they're going to take care of their families. And what once was uh, a lot of economic stability seems to be disrupted. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear that's going on in our world. And I think that Christians obviously are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus during this time. We're invited to be people that actively alleviate the pain and suffering of those around us. But I think we're also invited and called to be people that are on our knees asking the God of the universe to come and to bring peace and to bring healing, to come and to work what only, do a work that only he can do. I think we're called to to ask God to enter into the anxious spaces of our world and give a kind of comfort that can only come from him. So I invite you to, to actively be participating in the taking care of those around you, but also in praying to our God for all that's going on in our world. I think Christians have the ability in this space to be a healing community, a people who point to one who is greater than ourselves, but also tangibly take steps to reveal the love of God in very practical ways to all those around us, in all the unique and individual circumstances of anxiety, of hurts, of pains, we can enter into those spaces as ones who have come in contact with love incarnate, namely Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to do that. And I encourage you to continue to be flexible with us as we try to discern what is best for our church family, for the health of our church family, for the health of our community, for um, all the unique challenges that we face uh, during this pandemic. And we appreciate, as Nancy Lewis said on our Facebook page, that she'll be praying for discernment for our leaders. And I cannot tell you how much we appreciate that. So will you join me in prayer? And then we will dive into our lesson for this morning. Let's pray. God, this is just such a challenging time. There are so many fears, there's so much anxiety, so much real pain, there's real grief that is going on. And we just pray for you to come. We want you to do a work that maybe we ourselves can't even comprehend at this moment. We want you to bring a vaccine quick. We want you to bring healing to those that are suffering with the illness. We want you to bring comfort and encouragement to those who are engaging with grief right now. We want you to help those that are going through immense economic hardships. We want you to enter into those who are dealing with depression and loneliness because of the difficulties of 2020 and the difficulties of living in a world that is going through a pandemic. We just want you to be the God who comes and is with us, who loves us, who comforts us, who seeks our good in all things. And we pray to you because we cannot bring this about ourselves. We need you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, we're continuing our series on the Apostle Paul. And we're actually, instead of going to one of his letters like we've been doing throughout the series, we're going to look at one of the sections where Paul shows up in the book of Acts. And what we're really going to be engaging with today is, I think, a really important question. Is what Paul says today, is it just a nice platitude? Is it just a, one of those words of advice that sounds really good on paper? Is something that we might ourselves say? Or maybe it just works in certain circumstances, but in general, it's really hard to orient our lives around. Paul in our section today is actually going to be quoting Jesus. So it's Paul not using just his own words, but he's using the very words that came from Jesus. But I think it has the potential to be one of those things that you and I would affirm in certain settings that we'd say, yeah, that's really good advice. Oh, that's a really good point. But when we got to the moment of having to orient our lives around this truth, it becomes a little less obvious that it is true. 
I remember growing up and every teacher at the start of the semester would tell us the same advice. They would say, hey, if you do 15 or 20 minutes of the work that I assign you each day, if you study for your test for 15 or 20 minutes each day, then the night before the test, you're not going to have to cram. You're not going to have to um, spend so much time trying to get all the information that we've learned in this particular time between the last test and your next test. And they said, if you would just study each and every night, you would be much more prepared for the test and you would be less anxious and you'd be less stressed. And on paper, if you ask me, is that true? Is that right? Do you agree with that advice? I would say, of course. But I never actually followed it. I never actually implemented that advice in my life. So there was a certain disjunction Intellectually, I affirmed that that was true, but practically in my life, it didn't feel like the thing that I wanted to do that was actually going to bring me fulfillment, that was actually going to bring me joy. How many of us know intellectually, know that if we were, if someone was sharing a word of advice about how important it is to save our money rather than just spend it, spend it whenever we get it? We would be able to affirm that. We would check the mark of like saving is better than recklessly spending our money. And if you're anything like me, I know that. I would affirm that. But when it comes down to it, that moment in my life, I would rather just spend the money in that moment, get that immediate gratification than saving. So in a sense, I've affirmed the truthfulness of a statement without actually having it affect the way that I live my life. And in that way, it's become a bit of a platitude. And I think the words that Paul quotes that Jesus said have the same potential in our life. That these words have the possibility to become something that we would all affirm is true. But when it comes to our real lives, when it comes to the actual decisions that we make on a day-to-day basis, it becomes less obvious that this is the way that I want to truly live. Now, I think this is really a fitting passage for the season we're about to enter into. We're, We're entering into the Christmas season. You can't see all of it, but of course, our church building is decorated for Christmas. We're ready to go for that season. And this is the kind of verse that we will have on our lips and in our minds constantly during this season, especially at those moments where our kids want more and more and more and consumerism seems to be taking over them. What's the verse that we're going to quote at them? It is better to what give than to receive. That's probably one of those that we know by heart. And many of us in this season can get immensely sentimental about that passage. Many of us parents can say, yes, I've felt that. I've experienced the realness and the truthfulness of that text because I love that experience on Christmas morning when I get to see my kids open the presents. I love the experience of getting to give someone a gift and say, hey, I care about you. Hey, I love you. Open this up. See this and see the joy on their face and see the excitement that they experience. And so I think in a certain way, we would go, well, obviously, as we've matured, as we've grown up, we've learned that this passage is true. And I want to make my job today is to texture what Paul and Jesus means by it's better to give than to receive. And I want to put some flesh on it, and I want to make it not merely something sentimental, but something that we have to endure and engage with in our everyday life and still ask the question, is Paul, are Paul and Jesus right to say that it is better to give than to receive? And now I want to conclude with, why might this be the obvious posture that a Christian would take in the world? Where we find Paul talking about it being better to give than to receive is in Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, Paul has spent a substantial amount of time in the city of Ephesus. So he's been there helping the church grow, helping uh, build up leaders within the church in Ephesus. But now he's made the determination that he's going to leave Ephesus and head back to Jerusalem. And it's a really intimate scene in Acts chapter 20, because at this moment, the leaders in Ephesus are saying, please, Paul, do not go. 
Now, they don't want him to go to Jerusalem, not because they just want to keep him in Ephesus because they like having him around. I think that would be part of it. But they know what is likely to happen if he goes to Jerusalem. Paul at this time is not well liked by many of the Jewish people during Paul's lifetime. As one who abandoned being a Pharisee to join the movement that he was previously persecuting that hasn't won him a ton of friends within the Jewish community that has not embraced Christ as the Messiah. And so these leaders in Ephesus know that, and so they're begging Paul, please don't go. Stay with us. Because if you go to Jerusalem, your life is in danger. Well, Paul lets them know, I'm not too worried about that. If I'm going and I'm going to die, that's okay. I'm not fearful for my life. But what this allows us to experience is this intimate conversation between the leaders in Ephesus and the Apostle Paul. And they have this dialogue. And what I love about all of these kinds of scenes, and I feel like I bring this up a lot, is in moments where you know that you're parting from somebody, when you know that you're leaving someone, you say the most important things to them, right? So when you drop your son or your daughter off for college at, at college for the first time, you don't mince words, you don't waste things, you say the most important things to them. We've had this experience of leaving really close friends when we left Durham to come to Hot Springs. In those final days, especially those final moments, like we soaked up all the time we had with them. We said what was most important because in those moments, you don't want to waste your words. You don't want to waste your time. And we get that sense here in Acts chapter 20. Paul is saying to this, the leaders of this, these churches in Ephesus, and he's giving them the most essential things. And one of the things that he says to them is, There are some in your congregations that are weaker. Remind them of the words of Jesus, that it is better to give than to receive. Now, as I mentioned earlier, for the Apostle Paul, I don't think these were just sentimental words. I don't think that Paul is merely thinking of the context of, oh, you get to give these fun gifts to your kids, or you get to give fun gifts to your friends, and they're going to love it, and they're going to rejoice over it, and they're going to be excited about it. I think there's a deeper connotation when he says it is better to give than to receive. I don't think that Paul thinks gifts are only isolated to birthdays and Christmas and special occasions. I think he's talking about the kind of posture that he wants the people in Ephesus and that he wants Christians to have in general. And I think when he says it is better to give than receive, he's understanding that that might not always include the recipient loving the gift that they've received, appreciating the gift they've received, valuing the gift that they've received. I don't think he has merely, as we keep saying, a sentimental view because he, his, if his life is a representation of being a gift, being oriented to giving rather than primarily seeking out receiving good things, then his life itself on the surface doesn't look like a life I necessarily want to emulate. And you don't have to go that far. You can just go earlier in chapter 20. Early in chapter 20, in the same conversation with the elders when they're trying to dissuade him from going to Jerusalem because they don't want him to die. Paul says something interesting. He says, I don't know what's going to happen to me when I get to Jerusalem. I can't know for certain I can't know if the outcome is going to be good or bad for me, but he does say this. He says, I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know this from the Holy Spirit. I know this from the Holy Spirit. And you and I might think, wow, this is going to be really encouraging, good news. He's so attuned with the Spirit. The Spirit is actually speaking to him and telling him something. This has to be encouraging, especially because of what the way that Jesus describes the Spirit in the Gospel of John. The Spirit is the comforter, so surely the Spirit has a word of comfort for Paul. But in verse 23 of Acts chapter 20, he says that he can't know for certain what's going to happen in Jerusalem, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and affliction await me. Can you imagine that? 
Paul says, I don't know what specifically is going to happen in this city that I'm headed to. I don't know if I'm going to be killed. I don't know for certain if I'm going to be persecuted. But I do know that every city I go into, the Spirit gives me a message. The Spirit comes and tells me, this is what awaits you. Affliction and imprisonment. I don't know if I want the Spirit talking to me if the Spirit is making those kinds of guarantees, those kind of promises. But I think what it does for us is it reminds us when Paul says it is better to give than to receive. He is not merely talking about a life where it's going to be comforting, where it's going to be easy, where our giving is always going to be reciprocated with a kind of respect and appreciation and gratitude that it may lead us into a life that causes us pain and heartache and suffering. Which gets to the heart of the question, is it really better to give than to receive? I mean, a life oriented to seeking the good of the other as other. A life that's preoccupied with seeking the good of all those that are around us. That it's much better to live a life that's not preoccupied with hoarding all good and pleasurable things for ourselves, but seeking what is needed by those around us. A life that is not oriented to self, but oriented to the good of others. Is that really a good life or is that a platitude? I can't help in these, when we talk about this subject matter, to reference something that I've referenced multiple times because it was, um, it had this profound impact on me when I read it for the first time. It's from my favorite novel uh, written by Fyodor Dostoevsky called The Brothers Karamazov. And as I've told you before, there's a character in there who's this spiritual leader in the book named Father Zosima. And he's a a, a spiritual master, so he has this great wisdom, and people flock from all around to get his guidance and his wisdom. And one lady is is talking to him, and she's confessing that she she would give herself for the entire world She loves the world. She wants to serve the world. She wants to serve people. She loves people. And when you're listening to it, you think, oh, she has captured exactly what the Apostle Paul was talking about. It is better to give than to receive. But in the very moment, she has a moment of honesty where she says, but I'm fearful or I'm afraid, I'm paraphrasing it, that at the very instance, at the very moment that my love for the world was met with ingratitude, all of that love would dissipate. All of that love would dissipate. And what she's saying in light of the text that we've been looking at is, I would follow the principle, it is better to give than to receive up to the point that my gift is not received with gratitude, but is received with hostility and ingratitude. And I appreciate that section in that book so much because I think she expresses my feeling too. Because it's the moment that my serving somebody else, it's my moment that I give myself for somebody else, it's the moment I give that gift. And if we use the analogy we use so often, we give this great gift to our kid And our kid looks at us in hostility and hatred and does not receive the gift with gratitude. It loses the joy of the moment or it feels like it has to lose the joy in the moment. And at that moment, I would feel like maybe it was not worth it. I'm afraid it's at those moments that this becomes, the question arises, is that merely a platitude? Is it really better to live a life that is predicated on giving myself to others rather than seeking to receive? I wonder if a lot of us experientially are like the lady in the the book, Brothers Karamazov, who says, I have this great desire to love the world. I'm just afraid that that desire could be diminished, if not destroyed, at the first moment of ingratitude to the love that I want to share with the world. The Apostle Paul, because he's a follower of Jesus, I think would say that is the very moment that you should follow your exemplar, namely Jesus Christ, that this gives you another opportunity to give in such a way that your gift is not validated or invalidated by the response of the one who is receiving your gift. 
Because as Paul says, he's going to boast in one thing and one thing only, namely the cross of Jesus Christ. And if Jesus is the perfect embodiment of what it means to seek a life of giving rather than receiving, then his life on the surface looks like a gift that is constantly responded with not gratitude, but ingratitude, not even just indifference, but hatred, hostility. The very life of Jesus is, I'm giving my life for the world. I care for the world. I love the world. I'm giving myself for the world. And the world responds, as John tells us in the first chapter of his gospel. The world doesn't receive him, even though he's coming for their redemption and their salvation. Jesus' life is marked as being a gift for the world that is not received in gratitude, but is encountered with ingratitude and hostility. And the beautiful reality is that Jesus embodies for us, reveals to us, that even at the moment when the gift is not received, it is still better to give than to receive. It is still better to give than to receive. I want to conclude with asking the question, Is there anything that grounds this? Is there any foundational principle for why this is true? And we could say the reason it's true is because we see it in Jesus Christ. And that is the most profound and ultimate reason. But I want to give one other reason that Paul, I think, hints at in another place in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul asks one of the most indicting questions, at least of me, that has ever been asked. He asked this question, what do you have, talking to the church in Corinth, what do you have that you have not received? What do you have that you have not received? Now he's pointing to a very Jewish and Christian concept. The concept that you and I were brought into being out of nothing. That you didn't come into existence because you chose to be in existence. You didn't choose your qualities. You didn't choose to be um, born to this particular family. You didn't choose to, to be born in this particular time. You didn't choose any of those things. And even your life, as Paul says in another place, is sustained into being by God himself. That if God removed his presence from you, if he removed his being from you, you and I could not self sustain. Which means that if we drew everything back to its origins, we would have to say that everything I have, everything that I possess, everything that I think is intrinsically mine is actually a gift that has been given to me by God. And what Paul's question is not even hinting at, it's directly making us confront is that I don't possess anything within myself, but I am living, my very life is predicated on one who chose giving rather than receiving. And if I come in contact with that, Paul assumes, if I grasp that, if I feel that, if I recognize that, if the words that we say every week at the contribution, that, hey, we're just giving God back what is already his, if we see that not just with our money, but with every part of who we are, then I think the Apostle Paul would say, you are now ready to live into a life that reflects that reality, where because you've been given everything, you can give everything in return. I think one of the reasons it's really hard to have our gifts met with ingratitude is because we have falsely assumed that somehow it is ours intrinsically. That what we're sharing with other people, that we're giving with other people, is not our own, but it's just an extension of what God has already given us. And what we find over and over again, specifically in the revelation of Jesus Christ, is that God met your resistance. God met your hostility. God met you saying, ah, I don't think I really need that. Oh, I don't really appreciate that gift. And instead of responding to our ingratitude, instead of responding to our hostility, instead of responding to our indifference, with, well, I'm done with you, or it wasn't worth it, or that made it invalid, he chose to continually pursue and to give. And I think what he invites you into and he invites me into is a kind of life that says, 
even at the moments where I don't feel like I'm appreciated, when I don't feel like my gift is being received in the way that I would want it to be received, even in those moments, because I recognize my very existence, my very life, my very possessions and gifts all are given to me. They're not intrinsically mine. In light of that fact, when I meet those kind of responses, I can still live and affirm that it is better to give than to receive. I promise you, this is not just a platitude. A life that is oriented to seeking the good of the other is the only life where you can find ultimate joy and satisfaction. A life where you are preoccupied with receiving, a life where you're preoccupied with securing your place and your honor and your status and your goods and you want to consume more and more and more is always going to end in despair. It can never give you what you want. But a life that has captured the imagination that we see in Jesus Christ, where we seek the good of the other as other perpetually and constantly, is a kind of life that paradoxically brings joy and satisfaction and contentment that can never be found in any other way of living. And the Christian life is a radical affirmation, not just in the easy times, not just in the convenient times, not just in the times where people receive what we give in really positive ways, but in all instances that it is better to give than to receive because we serve a God who implements that, who embodies that, who reveals that with his very own act of creation and with the giving of his son. National Park Church, my hope for you and my hope for myself is that you will be a people that not only create uh, every so often participate in the act of giving rather than receiving, but orient your life in such a way that your life is a continual gift to everyone who is around you. Let's pray. God, we, we are so thankful to be your children. We cannot comprehend the gift that you've given us in your son. And we want that to orient every part of our lives. We want the gratitude of receiving an incomprehensibly good gift to overflow in everyday actions of our lives. God, give us the courage to continually give ourselves in love for our neighbors, even when people don't fully embrace that, accept that, or appreciate that. Help us to reveal love in every aspect of our life. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease. When we are your Instruments of peace. Where there is hatred, we will sow his love. Where there is injury, we will never judge. Where there is striving, we will speak his peace. To the people crying for i
remnants of peace. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instruments of peace. National Park Church, so thankful that you've joined us for our online service. I appreciate the fact that you've been flexible with us. I want to send you out. Go and be a gift to the world. Share the love of Christ in such a real and tangible way that your community and the people you come in contact with cannot help but see something unique and different about you and taste a kind of love that is so good and so beautiful that they will be captivated captivated by it themselves. Love you guys, praying for you guys. Can't wait to see you soon. Hope you have an incredible week. Go in peace, love God, and love neighbor.